Well, she only meant to help. Uh, Cecilia Jimenez was upset at the way a fresco had deteriorated in her local church in Borgia, Spain. And for decades, Elias Garcia Martinez's Eke Homo, or Behold the Man, had been a source of pride for the village church, but it was beginning to deteriorate due to moisture. And so with the, pres the permission of her pastor and priest, Miss Jimenez picked up her paints and brushes and set upon her own mission to restore the painting. She worked to a certain point and then left to go on vacation, expecting to come back and to finish her work. However, on her return, she found out that pretty much the whole world had found out about what she had been doing because Miss Gimenez's amateurish work had left the painting looking more like a monkey than Jesus Christ, causing some people to change the name from Eke Homo, Behold the Man, to Eke Mono, Behold the Monkey. And so the fresco had become a fiasco and art experts were uh, brought in to restore the painting to its pre gimenez state. Unfortunately, the fresco was deemed beyond restoration and so to this day, Echo Homo is gone and Echo Mono remains. Now, while Gimenez really messed up, I appreciate her heart. I mean, I, I appreciate her desire to serve her church. However, can I just say this at the start of a message on getting involved in ministry? Follow the example of her heart, not the example of her hands. <laughs> if you can't, don't. <laughs> but I invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. This has been our Bible school verse this week. It fits perfectly as we continue our series, Committed and Focused. Last week, we began looking at our common goal, being focused on God in the F of be first. And today, we look at the I, being involved in ministry. I think the subject of this message and this verse all week have caused me to just be doing a lot of watching as we've gone through Vacation Bible School Week. I've walked through the halls, I've stood in worship and watched our volunteers, and everyone has just been amazing. I mean, you know, we do Bible school at night, so people work all day, and then they come and work all night in Vacation Bible School. And it's an exhausting week, it's tiring, but they do so good, and it is a wonderful thing. But this year, I've been really pleased with our students, our youth ministry kids. Uh, there's no way to express the joy I experience now as a pastor, having been here almost 14 years, to get to watch our students serve, remembering seeing them as babies or as preschoolers and watching them grow up. And now I can't help but watch these kids on stage and think, who's going to be the leaders in a few years among those kids? These are the students. The students that serve this week in our student ministry are the kids we envisioned over a decade ago when we laid out our Be First goal. And they're living that goal every day, and I'm so proud of them and looking forward to getting to spend the next week with them at Glorietta Student Camp. So this morning, I want us all to consider this important part of our common goal and to realize how exciting it is that we all get to be involved in ministry. So look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. This is going to be a little different than you learned it, kids. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, to grasp this verse, we need to set it in its context. And so, in this chapter of this letter to the church at Ephesus... Paul is giving a bit of a spiritual biography of sorts. And so verses 1 through 10 all give three stages of life for the person who comes to know Jesus. Verses 1 through 3 tell us what life was like before Christ. Well, before Christ, someone is dead spiritually. And then in verses 4 through 9, they tell us what it is like once we have Christ in our life. And so because of Christ, we are alive spiritually. And then the last verse, verse 10, our focus for today, says that with Christ in our lives, we begin to do good. So our VBS motto this week was these three words, created, designed, 
and empowered. And I want to use those words as part of our reasoning for why every member of this church must get involved in ministry. And the first reason for that is you were created by God on purpose. Paul begins, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. In the Greek, the word we translate workmanship is the word poema. You can hear in that word poema our word poetry. But there's more to poema than writing or artsy kind of things. There's a hands-on kind of idea. And so that's why we translate it workmanship. In fact, every uh, modern translation that I consulted with the exception of one translated this word workmanship. The other one said masterpiece, which is also appropriate. So to add emphasis to this hands-on idea, Paul not only says we are God's workmanship, but then he adds we are created in Christ Jesus, using a different word to add that hands-on nature. The fact that we are God's workmanship means a couple of things. First, it means we are his work. We are his work. He didn't delegate our creation. He didn't. He didn't go buy us at a store and then say we belong to him. He made us to be his. But not only did he make us and that we are his work, but second workmanship also means that we're more than just something made because we are creatively made. God put something special into us. Uh, Consider a, a craftsman, a carpenter who can make just about anything. And that carpenter, that craftsman might make a wooden workbench for his shop, but he might also then use his shop to make a beautiful dining room table. Now, both of those tables are his work, but only one is really his workmanship. Only one is his masterpiece. You are the workmanship, the masterpiece of God. Not just a table in his shop, but you are something designed for a purpose. You represent God's creative power. No one looks the same as you. No one has the same gifts as you. Everyone is is a unique workmanship for God. But this verse also adds an added dimension to what God has done, even more than emphasizing just our physical creation. Also, when we trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he makes us a new spiritual creation. Remember 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. So when we respond to God's grace through faith, not only do we receive assurance of our salvation, but we are also remade by God's creative power to be a new person with a new goal. So in that sense, not only are we God's workmanship physically created, but we are God's workmanship spiritually recreated. No matter the circumstances of your birth, no matter what people have told you in life, you are not an accident. You, are, you were created by God on purpose. You are his workmanship in your physical creation. And if you have been saved, you are a workmanship spiritually as well. So lift your head a little higher because you were created by God on purpose. But let's hasten to add another statement. You were designed by God for a purpose. Paul continues, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. God put so much in you to create you and then made a way to save you, not just for the sake of doing it, but so that you could be something special to fulfill a special purpose he had for you. So think about that that dining room table that that carpenter, that craftsman has made. He doesn't build that table and then leave it in his shop to collect dust and tools and junk. He takes that masterpiece and he loads it up and he delivers it to the home for which he built it. And he moves that table in to a beautiful dining room and he sets that dining table in there and they put the chairs around it. And then for the next several years or maybe even decades and maybe even generations, that family will gather around that 
dining room table and they will eat and they will talk and they will laugh and they will cry and they'll even create some school projects and get glue and scars on that table. But that table was designed and crafted to fulfill a purpose. And so were you. You have a purpose. It's not just to go to school and learn stuff. It's not just to go to work and earn an income to support your family. It's not just to raise your kids. It's not just to keep your house up and mow your yard. Those things are all part of life, but there's nothing really uniquely you about those things. So in addition to the basic life stuff that you do, God has a unique purpose just for you. Perhaps he'll use your job for that purpose. Perhaps he'll use something else that seems rather mundane in your life for that purpose. And perhaps it'll be something completely different. But whatever the case, there is a purpose that God prepared in advance for you to do. And whatever that purpose may be, it is a good purpose. You notice that? It's good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's good stuff. We are recreated to do good works. Remember that spiritual biography, before Christ dead, because of Christ alive, with Christ doing good. Everything in our lives before Christ comes into our lives, no matter how good it may seem to be, it was death compared to what life is like with Christ in our lives. Because it's so different, it's so rich, it's so full with Jesus Christ. And with Christ, we do good. We fulfill the purpose that God had for us from the moment we were conceived in our mother's wombs. And those good works are more than just spiritual activities, such as sharing the gospel and studying the Bible or teaching in church or singing in the choir. Paul means that any work that we do in our life can be good when it meets legitimate physical, emotional, social, or spiritual needs, especially when it is pointing people to Christ. But how in the world do we do that? I mean, with all the hecticness and challenges of life, how in the world do we live according to our divine purpose? Like this, we do so with Jesus. The same resurrection power that saved you and took you out of the graveyard of sin can daily help you live for Christ and glorify Him. So then the question becomes, so how do I know that I'm doing good work that God picked for me to do? It's when you find joy in doing it. That's how you can know you're doing what God created you to do, when you find joy in doing it. Um, In the classic movie, Chariots of Fire, Olympic runner Eric Liddell's sister tried to discourage him uh, from his athletic ambitions. And Eric Liddell told her this, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. That's why Eric Liddell ran. That's also why I don't run. I don't feel God's pleasure when I do that. I feel closer to hell than heaven when I do that. (laughs) When you live according to your purpose, you will be blessed. You will be fulfilled. And when you use the gifts that God gave you to do what it takes to accomplish your task, you will lose track of time. You'll be bone tired at the end of the day, but you'll wake up the next day ready to do the good work again. You know, there's little in life that's more fulfilling than doing the work of God that's been entrusted to you. Booker T. Washington commented on the power of giving people good work to do. He said, few things help an individual more than to place responsibility upon him and to let him know that you trust him. Now, Booker T. Washington was talking about earthly leaders and trusting people with things. And that's an awesome feeling when someone says to you, look, I trust you to take care of this job. Would you do this and fulfill it for me? And then you do it and you feel just really filled up and excited about it. But think about this. We're not talking about an earthly leader giving you a job. We're talking about the master of the universe who has handcrafted you who has now hand-picked a purpose for you and given that to you and say, this is what I want you to do in my kingdom. That is a huge move. 
That is a, something that should make you feel uh, really excited and blessed. Your purpose may not be seen. It may not be celebrated by people. But it is seen and it is celebrated by God. Now, no matter how small it is, no matter how significant it may seem, it is important and it, one day you will understand its value. N.T. Wright, uh, New Testament scholar, describes uh, partnering believers with God by talking about a stonemason who's working on a part of a big cathedral, one of those cathedrals that takes years and years and years to build. And that stonemason is there chiseling away on his few stones. Maybe he's carving something. Maybe he's just cutting blocks. And that worker is not building a cathedral. He is building one small part of a cathedral. He's enacting the vision of the architect at the instruction of the contractor, and he's focused on his small part to play. He isn't even building his own miniature cathedral or throwing out the plans and doing his own thing. He is contributing in a small way to a project that is way bigger than he is. And so Wright says, they are not themselves, those stonemasons, building the cathedral, but they are building for the cathedral. And when the cathedral is complete, their work will be enhanced, ennobled, will mean much more than it could have meant as they were chiseling it and shaping it down in the stonemason's yard. Those stonemasons may think, man, nobody's, this doesn't matter a bit. But those stones that they craft are part of a magnificent construction which will last for generations. Never underestimate the purpose God has given you, for it is good. You are designed by God for a purpose. And third, you are empowered by God to fulfill a purpose. The fact that you are handcrafted by God for a handpicked purpose means that you will be empowered by God to fulfill that purpose. We have some cliches about that, and we have cliches because cliches are true. Things like, whoever God calls, God gifts. That's true. Where God guides, God provides. That's true. God empowers you to fulfill the purpose he has for you. And he does that in two ways. Through his Holy Spirit and through spiritual gifts. Every person who has been born again has received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling presence of the Lord in their lives. And in addition to that then, the Lord has given us spiritual gifts that we are used to fulfill the purpose God has for us. Though those who are gifted to teach will do that. Those who are gifted with more of a personal, tangible, hands-on kind of gift will do that kind of thing. When God handcrafted you, he put within you the gifts you would need for the purpose he handpicked for you. You are empowered to do what God wants you to do. And until you find that purpose and you start pursuing that purpose, you will feel like there is a void in your life. You've got to get involved in ministry to feel fulfilled and to have an impact. As someone has said, no one is impressed with the one lost record of the referee. No offense to those of you who are referees. But in church, you've got to get in the game. You can't just be looking at what people are doing and criticizing what people are doing. You've got to get in and be a part of the team. You don't have to be perfect to fulfill your purpose. You don't even really have to be proficient at first to fulfill your purpose. But you do have to be surrendered. Because only when you surrender to the Lord can He work in your life. You know what He can do? He can even make up your mess-ups. Even if you turn a painting of Jesus into a painting of a monkey. You see, there's more to that story about Miss Gimenez's fiasco fresco. Since that debacle happened in 2012, the fiasco fresco has brought good fortune on the little town of Borgia, Spain and to the Sanctuary of Mercy Church because every year, tens of thousands of curious visitors with a sense of humor come to see the tragic fiasco and they leave with souvenirs of the new and improved Eke Homo. Tourists now pump thousands of dollars into the little town and into the church and into Miss Gimenez's pocket. Ms. Gimenez might have failed in her restoration efforts of the painting, but many have said 
she restored the fortunes of her town, which until 2012 was reeling under a devastating recession in Spain. So who knows? Maybe Miss Gimenez fulfilled God's given purpose for her. I don't know about her. We may never know this side of heaven. But whatever the case for her, you are created by God on purpose. You are created to fulfill a purpose. And you are empowered to fulfill that purpose. So the question is, are you fulfilling it? Do you know even what it is? Perhaps you may wonder, how can I know my purpose? Well, answer these questions for yourself. Am I a born-again follower of Christ? Because that's where it starts. If you're not saved, you're not born again, then the Lord's not in you, He's not guiding you, it starts right there. Am I a born-again follower of Christ? Have you repented of your sins? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord, nor are you living for Him? Second, have I asked the Lord in prayer to show me His purpose for me? Sometimes we have not because we ask not. We need to say, Lord, what is it that you've designed me to do? What am I doing already that is satisfying because that could very well be related to your purpose. What do I do that energizes me? Again, that could be related to your purpose. What kind of people or things do I enjoy working with the most? That could be related to your purpose. I like to always give the example uh, of fin serving on the finance committee. There's some of you that think that's the most terrible thing in the world to do. But for people like my dad or people like Nick Nixon... They love the finance committee. They like get all excited about that. If that's not you, fine. But God's gifted other people to do that kind of thing. You know what? They probably don't want to go teach in Bible school. But some of you love to do that. You want to teach in Bible school, Nick? No? Okay, you'll pass. Okay, I figured. <laughs> Find out what it is. What satisfies me? What energizes me? What what kind of people and things do I like to do? That's probably what God's made you to be. And then finally, the most important, about what am I most convicted? When I look around God's world and God's church, what is it that really moves my heart? What are the needs that I see? That's going to be related to what God has called you to do. Now, in your worship guide today, there's a, a list of lots of ministries where we need help in the church. And it may be that you've been looking for a place to plug in, and this might be a good place to start. We have a lot of needs for Connect Camp that's coming up in July. We have some needs for the fall and Wednesday night as we prepare to launch that. And then we're trying to build out our first impressions team here at the Pineville campus with different kinds of greeters. Maybe it's uh, that you need to plug in and help lead in Sunday school. We have uh, several immediate needs in our children and youth areas for teachers. We need those filled. And then there's also Sunday school at LeCount. This will be about a six-month commitment beginning in August for you to go there, help teach Sunday school. It'd mean you would miss worship here because you would be doing Sunday school during this hour. But we have major needs for preschool and ex extended session director. That's because Miss Karen Elston that's here today has been doing that for 20-something years, and she's ready to back off and let somebody else take that. Right, Karen? And so she's like, yes, please. So if somebody loves to do that, we'd love to have you help down there with that. We also need four preschool teachers so we can service all the classes. We need four children teachers and two youth teachers. And that's because right now there's like one preschool class and there's one children and youth class. The one class goes from first grade all the way to 12th grade. We've got to break those up. We need teachers to do that because come September 11th, we're inviting people to come to this new campus and we need to have a place for their children and youth to go. And so if you would be willing to help us with that, any of these needs, just contact the church office and we'll put you in touch with the appropriate people. But it may be that something's not even on this list that, that God's going to call you to do. And, and here's what I have come to believe throughout my entire ministry. If a church ever has a need... The people to fulfill that need are either already in the church or about to come to the church. I've seen it over and over and over again. God never puts a need in our laps that he's not already going to fulfill. So if we have these needs, some of you are going to fill it or there's going to be some people join the church in the next few weeks that are going to fill that as well. So be praying for how God can use you in these ways or in other ways. Get involved in ministry because you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for you to do.